In the previous video, we looked at round off errors. I described where they come from, and now we want to take a look at how we can quantify the effect of those round off errors in this video and the next video. Remember, we're thinking about solving a system of linear algebraic equations, AU is equal to B, on a digital computer using a direct or an iterative method, but using inexact arithmetic. So these round off errors exist because of how numbers are stored in digital computers. And the question is, what is the effect of those round off errors? Now, if you think back to chapter one, when we looked at systems of linear algebraic equations, the only diagnostic we had was the determinant. So the determinant of the coefficient matrix told us something about the types of solutions that were possible for an AAU is equal to B system of linear algebraic equations. In particular, if the determinant of the coefficient matrix is zero, then the matrix is singular, it's not invertible, and there's no unique solution to the system of linear algebraic equations. The problem now is on a digital computer where there's small little errors in every single number within that coefficient matrix A, and there are additional round off errors produced when you calculate something like the determinant. Simply calculating the determinant and getting a number isn't as definitive. So for example, if you calculate the determinant and you get a very small but non-zero number, then that suggests that it's not singular, therefore it is invertible, and therefore there's a unique solution to the system of equations. However, it might just be that that small value of the determinant is simply because of the presence of round off errors. So the determinant is not a great diagnostic when we're doing these operations on a digital computer. So we need an alternative. So here I pose the question, so if I were to get a number close to zero for the determinant, so it's nearly singular, but how close is too close? In other words, how close is is close enough where I say, well, essentially the determinant is zero and let's regard it as if it was singular. So we need a way to quantify, in a sense, how wrong our solution is. So one way to do that, of course, would be to introduce an error vector. So an error could be the difference between the exact solution u hat and the numerical solution u that we have for our system of equations. Now the problem, of course, with the error is I don't know the exact solution, so I can't calculate the error directly. So an alternative to that is to use what's called the residual. A residual can always be calculated. It's B minus AU, we'll call it R. So if U were the exact solution to AU is equal to B, then of course the residual would just be zero. If it's not, because we only have an approximate solution, then the residual will be non-zero, and it'll tell us how wrong our solution is. Okay, so the residual is often used in commercial software, open source software, to give a quantification of where we're at in terms of the, the process of converging towards a solution. But there's two issues or deficiencies with the residual. The first one is that for some A, not all A, but for some A, the residual may be small even though the error E is large. So normally they'll go together, the residual is small when the error is small, but there are cases where that's not true. The second issue is that the residual is a vector. It's a b, which is a vector, minus a times u, which is a vector, so the residual is a vector. So we would like it to have a single scalar measure of the accuracy. So just a number that characterizes, quantifies the accuracy of our solution. Well, that's easy. We can do that simply by taking the norm of the residual vector. If we use the L2 norm, then that's just simply the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. It's the length of the vector in a geometric sense. So that's one way, and a very good way, to quantify the magnitude of the residual. So we get just a single number. Now just like we can take the L2 norm of a vector, we can take the L2 norm of a matrix as well. And that's given by the maximum of the L2 norm of A times U over the L2 norm of U. Here U sub i, notice, these are the eigenvectors of A. And so if you take the ratio of these norms, that's equal to the largest eigenvalue by magnitude of A. All right, so we can get norms of vectors, norms of matrices as well. So that brings us to the condition number. So we have the determinant, keep the determinant in mind, how it's defined, its deficiencies, and now let's think about it. Another way to quantify how amenable a system of equations is to giving us a good, accurate solution of a system AU is equal to B. So let's talk about the condition number. I'm not going to derive it here. I'm just going to give it to you. I'll show you where it comes from, but let me just define it for now. Using any norm, we're, we're going to use L2 norms, but there are other versions of the norms as well. 
the condition number of A or kappa of A sometimes we'll use is equal to the norm of A times the norm of the inverse of A. Now that's going to give you a condition number that's between 1 and infinity. 1 is perfectly conditioned, as you'll see, I'll explain why, and infinity is the worst possible case. So the larger the condition number is, the closer it is to infinity, the worse the conditioning. We say the system is ill-conditioned. And you'll notice it's a property of the matrix itself. It doesn't have anything to do with the right-hand side vector b, just the matrix itself, as is the case for the determinant. Now for the L2 norm, which is the norm that we'll be using, so you'll see the subscript 2's here, so that turns out to be equal to the ratio of the largest singular value to the smallest singular value. Now singular value decomposition was addressed in an earlier video, and remember they're in order from largest to smallest. So the condition number is the ratio of the largest to the smallest so in a sense, it's giving us a measure of the range of singular values. If the matrix A is also symmetric, then the condition number based on the L2 norm is equal to the ratio of the largest to the smallest eigenvalues by magnitude. Remember, eigenvalues and singular values are not the same. They're sometimes related to each other, and they sometimes give similar information, but they're not the same. But in the symmetric case, you can see again, it's the ratio of the largest to the smallest magnitudes of the eigenvalues. Okay, so let's talk about the condition number as defined here and what the consequences of small versus large values of the condition number. So a small condition number correspond to a well-conditioned matrix, so then the condition number is close to one, so that's good. So that means the range of eigenvalues or the range of singular values is very small. The best case would be if they're all just one, then 1 over 1 is 1, condition number is 1. That's a perfectly conditioned system. Now in terms of these definitions that I just gave in terms of singular values and eigenvalues, remember that the determinant of a matrix is equal to the product of the eigenvalues. If any one or more of the eigenvalues is 0, then the determinant is 0, and the matrix A is then singular and non-invertible. So in that case then, if one of the eigenvalues is zero, that would be the smallest one by magnitude, and therefore the condition number would be infinite because we're dividing by zero. So zero determinant corresponds to an infinite condition number. So large condition numbers is bad, small close to one condition numbers is good, and the reason why that is is because when the condition number is close to one, then we can be assured that the residual and the error are of the same magnitude. So then we would expect a small error in inverting A, or whatever other operation we might want to do on the matrix A. And then the larger the condition number, the more we expect the errors to become large and in fact pollute the solution that we get when we use a digital computer to do these operations, such as finding the inverse, which is what I'm going to do in a moment. Now you notice I've still been using these relative terms, small condition number, large condition number. So what's large, what's small? in the context of, of systems of linear algebraic equations. Well, it turns out that the condition number gives us a great way to accurately estimate how much accuracy we're going to lose when we do operations such as determining the inverse of a matrix on a digital computer. And that's given through this relationship here. So you take the condition number of your matrix, you take log base 10 of that, and that will give you an estimate for the number of decimal places that you'd expect to lose inaccuracy when you do an operation, such as the inverse. Now, we're generally using double precision. That's the standard in numerical methods. Uh, MATLAB uses that by default. Mathematica uses that by default. In a programming language such as Fortran or C, you have to specify that, but that's the standard we use in numerical programming, scientific computing. And the reason is because we have more digits to work with. So if we have 16, and if I lose, say, five or six, that's usually reasonable. I still have plenty of accuracy left in the solution. Now, of course, it depends on what I'm going to do with that solution. Is that the final solution? Am I going to use those numbers for, for subsequent calculations that I'm also going to lose accuracy on? So it does depend on what I do use those numbers for. However, if I only had single precision, eight digits of accuracy, and if I were to lose five or six, I don't have much accuracy left. So that's why we use double precision. 
Now you still might be thinking, well, I can still use the determinant, right? I mean, the determinant, if it's small, what if I had some gauge for how small is too small for the determinant, just like I now have for the condition number? Well, let me return back to the determinant and show you that there is an additional issue that comes in. And that is an issue we call scale invariance. So what's happening here is follows. Let me illustrate it in a very simple way. Let's say I have a matrix A, which is simply a diagonal matrix A down the main diagonal. So it's A times the identity matrix I. So A is down the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. The determinant of that is A times A times A times A to N times. So the determinant is A to the power N. The condition number, however, if I just have A's down the main diagonal, those are the eigenvalues of my matrix. They're all the same, they're just A. So the ratio of the largest to the smallest is A over A, which of course is always one. So for the condition number, the size, the scale of A, doesn't matter. It's scale invariant. However, here the determinant is not scale invariant. It does vary with the scale. For example, if A were less than 1 and N was large, taking a number less than 1 to a large power is going to give me a very small number. So whereas the condition number is more robust and is indeed scale invariant, the determinant is not so all this to say that as we develop our numerical methods, we need to keep this in mind. We need to have an appreciation for the effect of round-off errors in our calculations, and we need to understand how the condition number can be used to diagnose the effect of those round-off errors. This also highlights the importance to keep in mind every step in that numerical solution procedure is going to determine what our A matrix is in that third step. So every decision that we make along the way in the numerical solution procedure that influences in some way A, the coefficient matrix in our big system of linear algebraic equations, is something that will affect the condition number, how amenable our system is to getting a good, accurate solution. Now I do show here, it's grayed out, I'm not going to go over it in detail in this video, but I do show where the condition number comes from. Basically, perturbing the coefficients in the matrix and perturbing the solution U and seeing what the consequences of those small perturbations are. And what you'll find is the factor that relates those together is the condition number. So the condition number does come out of this sort of a derivation. Now in the next video, I'm gonna address an alternative to getting the condition number. As you see here, getting the condition number is quite computationally intensive. I needed to get the eigenvalues or the singular values of a, a large matrix, so that's a lot of work. So in the next video, we're gonna show an alternative which is much simpler in fact, so simple that we can often check by inspection.